everybody and welcome to the message of the hour. Our reading is coming from John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. That's the gospel according to St. John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And it's recorded, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. And Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had came from, though the servant who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. And Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The word of God for the people of God. And there was another short scripture that came to mind as God was giving me to prepare this word. And that's coming from the Gospel according to St. Mark. And it's the 15th chapter, verse 22 to 24. And that says in its recording, Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. The title of the message for this morning is The Best for Last. The Best for Last. We are in our Lent season, and the word Lent is derived from the old English word meaning spring. And it's a period of penitence and abstinence observed by many Christians. Lent usually begins on Ash Wednesday, and of course it follows through until Good Friday. It gives us 40 days, mind you, to spend fasting and in preparation for the celebration of Easter or the Day of Resurrection. Looking at our first reading, which actually is in Numbers 6, 1 through 8, we are looking at the character or the service position of a Nazarite. The servant name applies to Israel's chosen people. And this is to me, male or female, man or woman, who elects to take the vow prescribed in the book of Numbers, verses 21 to 20, verses 2 to 21, in the sixth chapter of Numbers. The religious and spiritual posture denotes, or it means, or it represents money, or symbolizes the one who is, by choice, choosing to vow themselves to be separated from others and to consecrate themselves unto God. Although there is no mention of any Nazarite in the Bible before Samson, yet it is evident that they existed before the time of Moses, though it is not recorded. We're talking about the vow of a Nazarite. This vow involves three things in particular. One is abstinence from wine and strong drink. Two, refraining from cutting the hair off the head during the whole period of the continuance of the vow. And three, the avoidance of contact with the dead. When the period of the obligation of the vow comes to an end, the Nazarite, be it a man or woman, who has divided the who has dedicated herself unto God, whoever it might be, has to go to the entrance of the tent of meetings to present his or her offering. And what is required is, number one, 
a one-year-old lamb without defect for the burnt offering. The second is a year-old ewe lamb without defect for the sin offering. And the third being a ram without defect for the fellowship offering, along with their grain offerings and drink. Offerings were very important. They also had to present a basket of bread made without yeast. They had to present cakes made of the fine flour mixed with oil, and of course, wafers spread with oil. Now, I guess you're probably interested in knowing what is the tent of meetings. Another name used for the Jewish tabernacle that was built as a place of worship for the people of Israel during the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness. So uh, from the 21st century, it would have been the church, but they referred to it as the, t the, the tent of meetings or the tabernacle. The Bible has recorded that only three persons were Nazarites for their lifetime. And those three persons who were sworn, dedicated, consecrated unto God for their entire life was Samson, Samuel, and John the Baptist. In its ordinary form, the Nazarite's vow lasted only 30 or to 100 days at the max. But as I said, there was Samson, Samuel, and John the Baptist were the only three recorded as being a Nazarite, being committed to this vow for a lifetime. Being a Nazarite was a symbol of a life devoted to God and separated from all sin. It was a holy life. On another occasion in the book of Acts, the 21st chapter, you will find that the feast at the Feast of Pentecost, Paul took on himself again to commit himself to the Nazarite vow. It is like our today's church service, should I say, for the 2020 year. They are assigned the name or the title or the position of deaconate, missionary, associate minister, trustee, school superintendent, leader, teacher, or pastor. This is the type of Nazarite, should I say, just like we are a type of Christ. Our name is defined as Christians. We are hopeful that the persons, be it man or woman, who con will consecrate themselves unto the Lord for a designated period of time to separate himself for the life's norms and, 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 and life's distractions and concentrate, meditate, reflect, repent, redefine our personal relationship with God. Simply put, this is the very precious time of our life when we focus on our interior being, the spirit within that motivates and directs us. And this is what Lent season is really about. If you could reflect on the Nazarite position, you could correlate that with our position during Lent. It is 40 days, and during this 40 days of Lent, some of us have elected to fast and eliminate certain food items or drinks from our diets. Some have committed to a more stringent fast and they actually miss meals for a period of time. But whatever it is, some may concentrate on eliminating so that they can focus more of their time and self into communicating with God, reconciling with God, acknowledging weakness, seeking to develop strengths. It's an exercise program that takes place over the 40 days where we're actually muscling and strengthening our spiritual muscles that we may be able to embrace the celebration of the resurrection with a better attitude, with an attitude of gratitude. Even when our churches perform the traditional and the religious ceremonies, such as installation of church officers, pastors, deacons, and the various servants, we are in fact the current generation that is reacting the works of our forefathers, even as far as back to the book of, of Genesis in the very beginning. We are applying ourselves to the rules. When the church embraced these servants, they are hopeful that they have 
dedicated themselves, that they have committed themselves, that even the ushers that perform their duties in greeting the guests and the members of the church, we are hopeful that they have consecrated themselves and committed themselves to service, to perform in excellence with the help of God. The best is for last. In essence, we are here this Lent season, 2020, by the grace of God, to look closely at ourselves with a spiritual magnifying glass. May we gloom in with high-powered lens to examine ourselves, to humble ourselves as children, not to stand in a position of defiance or rebellion and self-justification as would a teenager or an immature adult, but to sit piously with legs crossed in arrogance and to have the position of defense, but rather to confess our sins, to repent and to turn from our wicked ways, to look and see how clearly we need God's grace and mercy. Christ became the sacrificial lamb slain at the altar of Calvary for our sin. We only have to believe in him to receive the benefits of his works on the cross. He gave all who believe in him the gift of salvation. How generous, the best for last. So as we look at John, the second reading, John 2, 1 through 11, we find there that the wine has given out at the wedding feast. God had again saved his best for last. When we look at the, the, the grace of the new covenant as opposed to the law or the Mosaic covenant, the writer of Hebrews brings this out clearly. When he writes, they offer worship in a sanctuary that is a stretched and shadow of the heavenly one. For the Moses, when he was about to erect the tent, was warned, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry. And to that degree, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted through better promises. This contrast between the old and the new covenant is seen also in the first miracle that was performed by the mediators of the respective covenants, that being Moses and Jesus. The first miracle that Moses performed before Pharaoh was to turn water into blood as a sign of judgment. It was a type of exodus from bondage, period. And the first miracle that Jesus performed was at this wedding where he turned water into wine as a picture of the joy that comes through the new covenant of grace. And this is an exodus from sin. We're talking about the best for last. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ. As a side note, it is also interesting that the new wine was introduced on the third day. This served as a spiritual preview of the natural or, or, or the nature-defined Son of God who could not be held by death or the grave and raised up on the third day. Had he not done this, our faith would have been to note. In the ancient Near East, we know that water was scarce and wine was a necessity. It was not a luxury and it was not a compliment to the dining atmosphere, but it was the, the closest, purest liquid on hand. Due to its close relationship to the ongoing life of the community in association with grain and oil, wine is also representative of the covenant blessings God promised to Israel for obedience and which he would withhold for the disobedience. Finally, wine also represents joy, celebration, and festivity, expressing the abundant blessings of God. The best for last. When Christ blesses, he does it abundantly. We know that normally the water pots supply the water for the ceremonial washing in accordance with the Jewish tradition. Each water pot could hold 20 or 30 gallons. This means that the six water pots could hold a total of 150 gallons of water. Now for that water to be transformed without chemical influence from water to wine is a God move. There's no question about it. 
Running out of wine at the wedding feast could have potentially have resulted in a serious legal consequence for the wedding couple. Christ made up the deficiency, as he always does, just as he does at regarding our personal salvation. We have our deficiency, and our living in perfection is an impossibility without him. Wine is a symbol of joy. When the wine ran out, the wedding feast was at risk of embarrassment, but Christ's miracle assured lasting joy. This parallels the sinner's need for salvation. When we accept Christ as our Savior, repent and are baptized, we become a new creature, just as the water was changed into a new element. It went from, from, from H2O to being wine. John 2.11 says that this miracle manifested Jesus' glory, making water into wine glorified him, as does bringing sinners to salvation. We are excited that he, God has elected to save the best for last. And then, of course, uh, the last of, of, of the process of life sometimes seems so challenging. But how many times have we gone to a family reunion? And a cute little one was the spokesperson for all who were in elementary school. And another comes up who speaks on behalf of the middle school children of the family. And another still yet may rap their written lyrics to represent the high schoolers in the family. And the list goes on until someone finally stands up and says, and now we've saved the best for last. What about the times that we've had to eat our dinner? The asparagus, the beets, the rutabagas, the broccoli, the squash, and the liver? After having to eat those things that we hated most, our mother rewarded us for our suffering and our obedience and submission by saying, I've saved the best for last, and places a slice of your favorite double chocolate cake in front of you. Surely everyone remembers going to the dance held in our high school gym, and we had a chance uh, to dance to the DJ's line of special request recordings. We danced the songs and dances that we didn't like until finally we heard now the Motown sounds for the remainder of the evening. They say the best for last. And what about our summer camping trips? The swarm of nets, the mounds of ants, the hot sweaty days and the noisy crickets and frogs at night, the lumpy bumpy sleeping bag, and finally the bus arrives for a full day at the amusement park. And then the next closing day of camp, we have the big camp party, our favorite foods and drinks and games and new friends. The camp leader would yell, we say the best for last. What do these scenarios have in common? All of them require us to endure the unpleasant, the unwanted, the boring, the uncomfortable, the dull, the challenges, and the pains of it until the end. And at the end, we are rewarded with the best. It made it through. We waited. It was worth the aggravation. It was worth it all. It's like going to school through all of your years and all of your pounding of classes and all of your assignments and pressures and all of your testing and all of all the rigid, rigid uh, uh, the activities that were demanded. And then finally that great day comes when you walk across the stage and the best of the last of your education on that level was your diploma. And you can truthfully say it was worth it all. And I, I turn that to see that, and so it is the same with Christ. He suffered rejection from his own. The priests and rabbi and Sadducees insisted he be crucified. He was betrayed by a friend and arrested by Roman soldiers. He reattached the soldier's ear. He was beaten. With 39 stripes, he was sped on. His beard was pulled out. And crowns of thorns were set on his head. He stood in the court of three judges, three separate hearings. He was found innocent but sentenced to death by hanging carried his cross to up to Calvary. He was appointed, appointed a safe haven for his mother in the process, saved the dying soul in the process, and gave up the ghost in the process. But the best was the last. The best was the third day morning 
when he arose, as he said, it was the best. After all of the suffering, all of the affliction, all of the shame, all of the humiliation, after all of that, at the end of it all, he gets up. The best is for last. May we take on that attitude. May we have that kind of stamina. The new wine created by Jesus is symbolic of the new covenant of grace. It cannot be mixed or contained by the old wineskins, the old covenant, if you will. So we see from Jesus' miracles at the wedding that the new wine is the picture of grace in the new covenant. We're going to be far better. It is far richer. It is far more divine and designed for us. Lastly, this wedding should remind us of an even better wedding still to come, the wedding of the Lamb. I hope we will be there for no, no matter what challenges we must go through, may we remember that the best is truly the last and that we might count it all joy as we go along life's journey. This was the word of God for the people of God. I thank you for your attentiveness. May we bow our heads in prayer. To the God of Israel, the mighty one, and the author of life, we are so grateful that you saved your best for last. You sent others strong and wise, but not compared to your son and our savior. Warriors you have raised up for battle, and they have won, but none have been as victorious as Jesus the Christ, our savior, who defied death, hell, and the grave that we might live. Oh God, there is none like you. You are great and greatly to be praised. As we face this new day, we embrace it with the faith that we have found in you. Through your son, we fear nothing, for you are with us and encamp angels around us to keep us from falling. The power, oh God, that raised your son, Jesus Christ, from the dead, lives in us who believe. Where your spirit dwells, there is power, peace, and praise. To God be the glory, for we proclaim these things in Jesus' name. And may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.